I thank you all very much. Uh, at any point, if you can't hear me, uh, just wave your hand, let me know. Uh, so I am here today to talk about skills, and I think most of you are probably spending your summer developing using lots of exciting technical skills. Uh, but you're also developing and using a variety of non-technical skills, and that's primarily what I want to focus on today. I being able to say, I know how to use Python, uh, is a little bit more straightforward than how do I talk about being able to work effectively in a team. And so we're going to talk about why non-technical skills are important, help you think about how to identify them, and then discuss how to actually describe them to employers in ways that are uh, effective, efficient, and convincing. So that's our goal for the next few minutes. Okay, to start with the question, what skills do I have? Then we'll think about what skills employers are looking for, and then we'll talk about how to find an overlap and describe it to employers. But we start here with what skills do I have? And I want to pause and talk for just a few minutes about what even is a skill? It's a word we hear a lot, uh, especially in my profession in uh, career services and career development. We talk about uh, skills a lot, but often don't pause to actually define them, to think about what they are and how they work. So, a skill isn't a credential. Saying I have a bachelor's degree in animal science isn't a skill. Right? It might suggest that I probably learned some skills in the, the process of that, but it itself is not a skill. It's something I run into a lot in my work is people using credentials to mean skills and then not actually explain the skills. So it's not a credential. It also isn't a piece of knowledge necessarily. It's not something you know. It's what you can do with what you know. Right? Understanding something is often very important. It's an important piece of knowledge to have, but being able to act on that, that's where the skill comes in, being able to do something. Right? Understanding the you know, syntax of a language is one thing. Being able to use it to actually produce an outcome that you want is another, and that's really where the skill comes in. Because a skill is something that produces a thing. Right, there's an outcome to a skill. It's an action that results in something. That something can be tangible. It can be you know, a piece of hardware, and it can be uh, right, uh, a paper, right, or a social media marketing plan or something like that. But it can also be intangible, like a really effective team, right, or uh, an ability to manage your time. Uh, really effectively and get things done. Right. So I want to emphasize that produces something because I should really be thinking about actions and red skills as actions that produce things. Skills are also developed through experience. I think we tend to talk uh, about skills sometimes as if they're just innate things. Right. I'm bad at writing, right? or I'm good at X. Right? And I mean, that may be true, but it also isn't fixed and static. Right? That that can change. Getting more experience with a skill often does make you better at it, uh, which is why it's actually really important to be able to explain to employers where you are in having a skill. Right? Because a skill isn't a binary state. You don't either have it or you don't. Right? Uh, so, like that. A skill is something that can be big, right? that can be kind of a big picture skill like uh, <coughs> written communication right? is a set of skills, pretty big picture, used in lots of different contexts. A skill can also be a small thing, a very specific skill that's only used in one particular circumstance. So like the ability to write a uh, really effective tweet that includes a call to action that gets somebody to click is a really specific kind of small skill, but an important one. So you kind of want to think across this range of scale 
for skills and not just get really fixated on the, just the big ones. And also, and this is where I want to, to spend a minute because we'll be returning to this over and over again. Uh, how many of you have heard people talk about hard skills or soft skills before? Good number of you. It's a pretty common way of thinking about uh, a major distinction in skills between technical skills and non-technical skills. Uh, I think that language is often not actually very useful, if only, and we'll return to this later, because soft skills, those non-technical skills, uh, collaboration, communication, uh, interpersonal interaction, uh, are actually pretty hard. Right? They're pretty, uh, and that's what we hear from employers, uh, which we'll get to in a little bit. But raise this hard, soft, I'll use technical and non-technical skills to kind of avoid the value judgment that's in hard and soft, but when we talk about skills, we mean all of it. And when employers, as we'll see, talk about skills, they mean both. Okay, that's what a skill is. Next question is which ones do you have? Uh, so a handout is going around. Uh, is it the checklist looking one? Yeah. Great, okay. So, you'll each get, it doesn't matter that you can't see that, because uh, you'll all get a copy. Uh, you're each going to get a handout with this document. It's essentially like a checklist, uh, a framework for thinking about clusters of skills, particularly but not only non-technical skills. Uh, and this is a framework that the Graduate College has developed, working with graduate students. Uh, for years and years, helping them identify uh, and communicate about their skills. So, as you get this worksheet, what I'm going to ask you to do is take a few minutes and look at it, read it over. If you have a pen, you can use a pen however you want. Some people I rate themselves one to five for each of the skills. Other people I would be better developing faces and crowded faces. But you can also just it, but look at every single skill on the list and think about where am I in terms of my ability to use this skill to produce things in a way. Does that make sense? Okay, so one at a time, go through the skills and ask yourself, how proficient am I in this skill? Uh, you might mentally give yourself a rating and and I will give you about three or four minutes to do that. When did this thing stop? Yeah. Five or seven. Five or seven. Like that, right? 
uh, as I think common ones for people to feel a little iffy about. This can also be a tool, uh, not just for thinking about what skills you have, but what skills you might need. Okay. And that could be even more useful, or you can kind of do that even better. But moving on to our next step, we'll kind of sit with this what skills do I have piece, we'll return to it uh, in a bit. But we're going to think a little bit about what skills do employers have. So, I think employers are generally pretty good about uh, communicating what technical skills they want. Uh, often, maybe a little bit too good at it. Uh, I work with, I look at a lot of job ads in my my job, and I think employers can sometimes get a little bit enthusiastic in listing uh, technical skills they want for a role, uh, but they also really do want those non-technical skills. Uh, I know this is a little challenging to read, so I'll kind of walk you through it. Uh, but this is a result of a survey that the National Association of Colleges and Employers does every year asking recruiters to rate how essential different skills are for success at their companies. Right? They also, in a different question, ask them what skills they really look for in a resume, and the results are almost identical. So, include this one. Uh, the top one that is pretty much always the top on this list is critical thinking and problem solving. Right, followed by teamwork slash collaboration, followed by professionalism slash work ethic, which I think is kind of vague, and in uh, other parts of the survey, uh, turns out that employers mostly mean kind of initiative, the ability to like, claim a project and like, get it done and do what you need to do uh, stuff. Then oral and written communication, and leadership, then digital technology, then career management, and then global slash multicultural fluency. So, particularly those top five are pretty much always the top five and sometimes shift places a little bit. But you notice, you know, these yellow arrows I have put next to all of the non-technical skills, uh, those skills in communication, in, uh, interpersonal interaction, and in collaboration, critical thinking, and problem solving. Uh, as I said, it's pretty much always number one. So this is one way of thinking about what employers want, is to think kind of in aggregate. What do employers want, generally? Uh, I'm going to pull another piece of this survey out uh, as well, which is they asked the recruiters to rate a bunch of competencies, uh, ask them, do you consider this essential? And uh, are your new hires proficient in this skill? So the red is the considered essential. The blue bar is rated proficient. Uh, and I'll go over here is the right, professionalism and work ethic is here on the uh, the right, and 100% of recruiters said that professionalism and work ethic is essential, and only 42.5% say their new hires are proficient. Uh, oral and written communications, 95.9% say it's essential, 41.6% say their new hires can do it well. Another one, leadership is 68% versus 33%. Uh, really, the only one where uh, proficiency is on top is digital technology. So all of those non-technical skills are ones employers say they want, and they aren't really getting. And, and when we talk to employers, uh, my office has an employer relations, uh, Function and when we talk to employers, we hear very similar things. Right? Uh, they get new graduates who are really proficient in a lot of technical areas that are absolutely necessary for their jobs, 
but a really hard time interacting with people and you know, getting their work done and managing their time and <laughs> writing a memo that isn't garbage and uh, all of these things. Right? So I like this. I particularly like this graph for just the starkness of the contrast, but it also and it starts to indicate why it might be important and valuable to communicate to employers that you can do these things if you can do them. Right? If you have these skills, they're skills that employers want and skills employers feel like they aren't yet. And they want them, I want to pause for a second to think about why employers want these skills, why they consider them essential, and why they particularly want their new hires to have them. I think a big part of that is these skills, non-technical skills, are actually pretty hard to teach them. Right? You can kind of teach somebody a new piece of software you know, relatively easily. A lot of companies just have to do it because they have proprietary systems. Right? But teaching somebody how to like, work with a difficult team member right? or communicate with uh, clients right? if they can't do that. And if they don't know how to work on a team, they don't know how to talk to people with different levels of expertise, that's hard. And it's expensive to teach them if you can't have your employee, employee getting to work immediately. So they're hard to teach, but they're also really essential to having teams function. Almost everything you'll end up doing will be collaborative in some way, right? and if companies want efficient and effective teams, and it's good for uh, their bottom line. And also, when they're hiring, they're often thinking about uh, career paths, right? promotional tracks, right? and people with significant leadership, critical thinking, problem solving skills right, are more likely to thrive and grow with an organization, right? rather than just be kind of a uh, and get stuck. So other ways to figure out what employers want, and in particular how to think about and investigate what non-technical skills employers in a particular area want. Because right? people hiring, employers hiring in sales want a different set of non-technical skills than people hiring developers. Right? Uh, so, I think one of the easiest and best for a variety of reasons is just talk to people and ask them. Right? When you're networking with people, ask them what non-technical skills are really important for success in your field. Or what skills do you wish you had had when you graduated? Right? That can help you start to investigate there. You can also see a little bit on social media, particularly LinkedIn, Think about which employees they're highlighting, what are they highlighting about those employees, how do they talk about their employees, and give you some things. Uh, websites about employers, which is a really kind of vague way of saying Vault and Glassdoor and things like that, can give you a little bit of information, take it all with many grains of salt, but uh, alongside everything else, that would be useful. And then job ads. Like job ads are I sometimes <laughs> challenge it just because they tend to be kind of structured a little bit weirdly, but often a useful way of understanding what uh, skills are really essential for a particular position. <coughs> so in a job ad, you'll find skills in a few different places. Uh, and I want to pause here because when I work with students and I ask them, they bring in a job ad, I ask them that what skills are they looking for, because we're thinking about how to write the resume and things like that, uh, they often go straight to and stay with only the section in a lot of job ads called skills or qualifications, and don't look in the rest of the job ad, which actually can communicate a lot about skills. So you could find it in the description of what this person would be doing, is going to not explicitly state we need this kind of communication skill, but if it talks about uh, working closely with the team, 
and particularly a cross-functional team, that tells you something about the kind of communication and collaboration skills that are needed, divided in duties and responsibilities, and qualification skills, obviously, and experience or education. Right? They want that because they want a certain set of skills, and so you might be able to infer something from them. We pass up the next handout. So, I think people often think about applying for jobs, assessing job ads, thinking about skills and employers like this. Like, the employer says, this is exactly the slot we need filled, and your job is to fit precisely. Right. And what that often does for many people uh, is encourage them not to apply. Right? If I don't fit exactly the skills they want, I, I shouldn't apply. And that really ends, to, ends up uh, disproportionately affecting uh, people from marginalized communities. Right? And so I want to encourage us all to think about it more like this. It's a little bit squishier than that. Uh, it's not fitting exactly, it's overlapping and being able to communicate that overlap in a useful way. So we're passing out a sample job ad. It's a real job ad from a nonprofit consulting firm. What I'd like you to do is read the job ad and think about, maybe talk with the neighbor about what are the top three skills this employer is working for. What are the top three skills that this employer is working for? skills this company is looking for. Mm 
What skills are they interested in? Yeah. Communication. What kind of communication skills? Yeah. So being able to communicate both with team and with clients. I think in particular, talk about close relationships. Right. So being able to uh, forge those relationships, like that kind of interpersonal day-to-day -day, uh, communication, but also present findings in a variety of ways. Right. So I ask that right, because I think communication is the big category, and then it's worth when evaluating a job at then ask right, questions, what kinds of communication, how does that break down? Yeah. Uh, project management. Project management and leadership. Yeah. And you see that a few different places, right? I think that's a good way to identify if something is a top skill is how often it appears. <laughs> right? uh, they talk about the juggling multiple demands, right, as well as explicitly calling out project management experience. What do you think is the third skill? Yeah, analyzing and interpreting data. Right. I'd add in there probably managing too. You can think about they talk about the knowledge base as well as the quantitative and qualitative data. There's a lot of kind of processing, organizing large amounts of information. Okay. So what you might do if you were thinking about applying for this associate consultant job, think about what is the overlap between the skills you have and the skills they're looking for. Right? And sometimes that might be pretty straightforward. And in other cases, you might need to really <coughs> think about it. Uh, figure out uh, for that juggling multiple demands is that a skill you have? Where have you used that skill? Um, so. so, as a kind of exercise for you, when you go, is you might actually sit down and think about this ad, which is chosen to be one that you're probably all technically qualified for. All of you probably apply for this job. You may or may not want a job like this. You may not enjoy it. You may not thrive in a job like this, but you probably could. Right? And how could you describe your experience in a way that highlights the skills that they are looking for? How do you pull those skills? How do you, when describing jobs you had or volunteer positions uh, you've been in, how do you pull out and highlight the fact that you probably have juggled multiple being a student pretty much by definition means <laughs> and sometimes what it means is thinking about translation translating the from the context you've done something in maybe a school context or a registered student organization context and making it make sense to the employer making it uh, legible to them as something that they care about because they might not automatically think, oh, this person is a leadership role in this student organization. That means they have good project management experience. You need to actually explain that. You want to think about the language you're using. Use the language that they use so that they can see it and so it's really visible. But explain, give context, and then Hopefully, that makes it easy for an employer, particularly a recruiter, to see those skills. So let's look briefly at what that might look like. So on the screen here is an entry for uh, on a resume for being vice president of a student organization, and this looks a lot like early drafts of resumes that come into my office, where the bullet points say, organized fundraiser, held meetings, ran club Facebook group, and trained successor. Do you see a lot of skills really obviously communicated there? Not really, right? If I sit down and I think about it, and I'm in a really generous mood, I can see what skills were involved there. But if I'm a recruiter who's spending 15 seconds with a resume before deciding whether or not this person is interesting and worth further consideration? Probably not, right? I'm probably thinking, you know, I'm not hiring somebody to organize a fundraiser. Right? 
so what do I care about this? Right? Or held a meeting, so woo, that's super exciting. Um, so how might you use roughly the same space, I think the next example takes up one more line, but in a way that is more dense with skills and also communicates those more clearly, pulls them out. So you might, well, formatted version, uh, end up with something like this, the size is different and all that, but manage year-long $5,000 fundraising project involving coordinating diverse stakeholders, monitoring progress, and competing deadlines. It's a sort of designed with this associate consultant job in mind. Build close relationships with colleagues, one-on-one, -on -one, in groups, and online to facilitate collaboration and motivate increased performance. And develop knowledge base and succession plan to facilitate transition. So there's more explanation in here. There's kind of both more context and it's less tied to the specific context of being in a club. Uh, something else I'll note that, that happens here is these bullets answer a how or a why. Right? And I think that's maybe one way to think about how to communicate your skills more effectively in a resume is that a bullet point should explain how you did something or why you did something. Because the how can get at their critical applied sort of skills and the why can get at the critical thinking and problem solving. Right? Having you think about why you're doing something to what end, what was the outcome. Right. So this is just one really kind of quick example of how you might do that. I encourage you to go home, think about how could you include a bullet in your resume for your internship experience this summer that captures the non-technical skills you're using. Right? A really good idea to have that in there. How could you alternatively infuse bullet points that are focused on technical matters, infuse those with non technical skills as well to emphasize the collaboration? And so on. Okay, so you can get the slides at go.grad.illinois.edu slash rp interns if you would like. Uh, Thank you all very much. I'll be up here for a few minutes if you have questions. Uh, but thank you all for coming.